Welcome. I'm Michael Shaw, the publisher of Reading the Pictures. Our site is dedicated to understanding news photographs and visual news. We're completely unique for our image-driven approach and our analysis of major news stories through discussion of the pictures themselves. As I wrote on Facebook yesterday, the photos from this presidential campaign have crossed every genre, from comedy to melodrama to horror. With more drama in store, this is a unique opportunity to analyze some of the key pictures so far. As I'm proud to say, we have the photo world and academic experts to draw the deeper meaning and intelligence out of the spectacle. Our live broadcast, by the way, also includes a side-by-side -side audience chat. If you're watching the replay, you won't see it, which is an inducement to register for the live version and participate in the discussion. In addition to our renowned panel, I want to thank our producer, Phil Bata, and editor-at-large, Meg Handler, for all their hard work to make this program possible. And now, I'd like to introduce our esteemed moderator, Kara Finnegan. Kara is a writer, a historian of photography, and a professor of communication at University of Illinois. I turn it over to you, Kara. Thanks, Michael. Um, welcome, everybody, to today's Reading the Pictures Salon. Uh, it's my pleasure uh, to start things off today by introducing you to our panelists. Uh, Karen Anderson is Professor of Communication at Colorado State University, where her research focuses on rhetoric, political communication, and gender. She is co-author of two books, most recently 2013's Woman President Confronting Post-Feminist Political Culture. Todd Heisler has worked as a staff photographer for the New York Times since 2006. He's won a number of awards, including a Pulitzer Prize for Feature Photography for Final Salute, a project about the return of fallen U.S. Marines killed in Iraq. Lorette Steinberg is Associate Professor in the School of Photographic Arts and Sciences at Rochester Institute of Technology, where her research and teaching focus on documentary, photojournalism, and photo ethics. Judy Walgren is Editorial Director of Viewfind, a platform for photojournalists and visual storytellers. Until very recently, she was Director of Photography at the San Francisco Chronicle. Among her many awards, she was part of a team of journalists at the Dallas Morning News that won a Pulitzer Prize for a series, of human rights, a series on human rights abuses against women. Uh, so welcome to our panelists and uh, also welcome to our audience. Before we dive into the edit, uh, I have a couple of procedural notes. If you're watching the salon live, you'll be able to participate, discuss, and ask questions in the chat box at the right. And please feel free to do so. Uh, but do be aware that anything you type in the chat box will have a short delay of about 8 to 10 seconds. So if we're not immediately addressing your question right away, hang on. We just haven't seen it yet. So thank you. Uh, and please feel free to participate in a lively fashion in that space. Um, also, for those of you watching live, if your screen temporarily loses the live broadcast, um, usually just refreshing your browser will do the trick. So with that, um, let's dive into the edit and uh, take a look at the first image uh, that uh, was selected for um, uh, to, to start us off today. Um, this is an image that was part of a photo shoot, I think, that was tied to a Time feature story um, from August 2015. And I guess I'll just kind of invite people to launch in by making the observation that this picture reads a lot differently to me now than perhaps it read to people uh, in August when it was first created. So um, I'm curious to hear what our panelists have to say about it. Has anybody seen the video that also went out from this shoot? Mm -hmm. uh, because I can't look at this without seeing him and his and Trump's reaction when the eagle decided it didn't necessarily want to cooperate. <laughs> and and I almost would rather see that photograph. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but I'd like to hear from other people whether or not you've seen the video. Yeah, I have seen the video. When I both the video and this picture kind of struck me as kind of a Stephen Colbert, like it looks like something that you would see on Comedy Central for a, a parody of a presidential candidate. Um, and I think that notion that, that Trump is sort of a parody of the ideal presidential candidate that Fox News and the Koch brothers have, have created, um, is it's more sinister now uh, than it was in August, but I think it, that sort of comes through in this picture as well. 
Yeah, and I think it also just kind of speaks to this overall spectacle that has been evolving over the last many decades. Um, I think I've covered every election since 1988. This is the first one in recent years that I haven't covered as a photojournalist or a photo editor. And each four years, it gets more and more over the top. And I think every right when you think you've reached the top, <laughs> it goes <laughs> a bit more up. And I think that we are a witness to that now. One of the interesting things to me in looking at this photograph is I don't think it has, I don't think it gives the message that they were perhaps hoping. He does not have that bravado and confidence. He still shows some of that concern about the eagle being there. You know, he looks hesitant with his thumb up. So I, I don't think this came out in perhaps the way that they had intended. Uh, Todd, how would how would you have put that together? Um, the photo shoot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I thought this. Yeah, I, I mean, I love I love Martin Scheller's work as a, as a portrait photographer. So I think this was the way this was put together was brilliant. And I think also having the context of the office and the the collections mm -hmm. of memorabilia are are a really important aspect to, to have included. Other than you know, you could have done this very easily with a clean backdrop. But mm -hmm. I think by by having the context of, of his office at Trump Tower in Central Park, I mean, it just, you could just there's a lot to see here, and it and it just coincides with <clears throat> him holding the eagle. Um, I think it should note, you know, I, I think you can say this about any of the other pictures as well. But you know, from what I read, I don't I don't know Martin personally, but from what I what I read about this shoot, that that Trump and and his camp were actually really into this idea. And I had never heard whether they liked the final product or not, but I would I would suspect maybe they did. And I think what's important to add about how we perceive these these photographs are how one side perceives it very different from the other in the same way they look at the any sort of political issue. So while people might look at this and say, you know, oh this is a this is great, it's a parody of Trump, you know, and, and it falls mm -hmm. into this thing, there are many other people who would look at this and say this is amazing. This is a beautiful picture. This captures what, you know, he wants to project. You know, as the eagle, and and you know, people might see it uh, totally different. And yeah, uh, I think. <clears throat> sorry, go ahead. I, I I agree. The timing is everything. Uh, looking at these pictures, especially today, um, when when this and and the fact that the video came out several months later, I think Time released the video where he was kind of a little bit intimidated by the eagle and the eagle was making him look uh, silly. You know, it was like more capturing where we were eight or ten weeks <clears throat> after this photo came out. Uh, when this, this as a study for their cover was really more at a point in time in August when we were, you know, we were laughing with Donald or a lot of people were as opposed to laughing at him. And then the use of the eagle was not even a parody, but it seemed more like him playing with uh, the idea of, you know, the statesman, uh, almost like a founding father. So, um, you know, this it, this does read a lot differently now than it was um, back then. This, in some way, this represents to me like the tr millions and millions of dollars of free advertising that that Trump was and and continues to get. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's interesting to me about this image is. Um, in its profusion of what I would call uh, pretty thin symbolism, it's um, it's very Trump, right? The awards and the back lining the wall, the the football helmets, the eagle. It's America. We're going to be great. We're you know. I mean, I, I, as I look at this image, I can literally hear him um, in his speeches with the kind of um, hyper you know, aggressively positive adjectives, just, you know, they're literally kind of spewing all out behind him in the, you know, the 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 vaguely unidentifiable awards, some are glass, some are plat, like, what are all these awards? Are they all his? You know, <laughs> um, the portrait of himself in the lower left. I mean, so to me, what, it's sinister and it's funny, but it's like this fabulous combination right now for me of both of those at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Todd's comment about, you know, you you can look at this photograph and come to, to a couple of different conclusions. I mean, you know, we'll we'll see it as a parody. I see his uncertainty. He's prob probably just got that shot and he wasn't quite as full of stance and so on. I'm sure Todd said about 
everybody else saying this is a dynamic and, and the heroic image is true as well. And and uh, Kari, were you going to say something? What? So I was just going to say about the trophies. Um, they struck me as really funny because to me it looks like trophies you might have in a kid's room. You know, they're they're kind of small and they look sort of cheap and and they're just all shoved in there, you know, as, as we live in this age where everybody gets a trophy for everything. Um, so I thought that they were, they were kind of comical in that way. And then I wanted to note the cross that he has in the back. It, it is importantly behind all of his trophies, right? So his trophy is much more important than the cross. Um, but that just, you know, underscores this notion of trying to throw everything in to appeal to, um, you know, that demographic he's trying to reach. The other thing I thought was funny about the facial expressions, um, I, you do note the tentativeness on, on his face, um, and I think the eagle looks much more commanding and, and presidential in this picture in terms of just the gaze, you know, the gaze that we <laughs> normally see in pictures like this. The eagle knows what its job is, right? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I am an eagle. I'm supposed to be the I keep thinking head injury. <laughs> what? From the helmet. Oh, the football helmet? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, well, you know, the, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Michael. I'm sorry. No, I mean, I just, there is, it, it, it's the manly man, you know, in the football. And, and, but, you know, when you think about the NFL, and it has also, it's got that presentation level and, uh, you, you know, America's game, but then, you know, that the, there's the insidiousness just behind it and how there's this sort of, national collusion not to like look at that too closely and it that parallels you know the whole way we look at Trump. Oh I like that. Mm -hmm. Don't look at it. And there is the boxing cupid doll. Don't don't miss that. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah, I think just, just between uh, Trump's elbow and the window. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to point out Sandra Roa reminds us, calls our attention to the caption and says, you know, the Eagle's name is Uncle Sam. <laughs> So, you know, uh, he, he does know what his job is. <laughs> I think Michael brought this up, and this came up before, but I, I can't stress this enough, the, the importance of, of context and when the, ti the time that these photographs are made, and then as we look at them uh, months later, depending on where we are in the campaign and what's been happening, and, I, and that, that changes your perception of these images dramatically depending on where we are in that in that. Uh, campaign timing. Yeah, and that actually I think might be a great transition, um, Todd, to the next photo in the edit, which is a photo that you made um, mm -hmm. of the Trump announcement um, uh, last summer um, in in New York City. And I wondered if you might um, maybe talk uh, a little bit about how you see this image now today, maybe uh, differently than when you were covering that event, if you do. Well, yeah. Um, well, just yeah. Give you the context. This was the announce. This was his his big announcement for the um, presidential candidacy uh, last summer, and you know it, it didn't really come out of nowhere. But uh, I think you know for people who weren't following politics very closely, it did. And um, the one thing that that came up, you know, when you talk about context and timing, you know, there were there were numerous numerous articles or reports that that there were paid actors. Here, the pay who were paid to wear T-shirts and be supporters at this event, huh. and I and I did overhear a lot of people saying, you know, at this event, where who who are, who are all the supporters? Where did they come from? And um, now we fast forward to a different time, and and that's kind of a moot point. You know, we, I mean, we're still trying to figure out who everybody's supporters are, but there's no lack of supporters. You know, there's no need to pay anybody now. Um, but I should say about you know the angle and where we are. I think if if you have an event at Trump Tower, um, you have to really give the context of of what that place looks like for anybody who's never set foot in it. And um, I think it's in, you know important to show the color and the the gold, uh, which which is okay. this. Right. Um, and I think I think also I think you know covering any political event. You know, you're just you're kind of working down a checklist of the things that that you want to show, and so you know you you're working tight, you're working medium, and you're obviously looking for mm -hmm. something like this to give uh, an overall, but also give you know give context to it. 
I think, you know, as well, Trump Tower represents the over-the-top capitalistic dream being achieved. It's a visual cue. It's a visual uh, kind of place that people can project their hopes and dreams as to where they want to be one day uh, as well. Well, and Judy, that's such an interesting point. I mean, the thing that I noticed about the Trump Tower announcement is is the obvious opulence, which is a little bit of a detour from what candidates usually do, particularly populist candidates, um, exactly. where they, you know, situate themselves among the people, and Al Gore comes out in flannel shirts with the sleeves rolled up. You know, Donald Trump is managing to 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 have this, you know. Be, present himself as the populist candidate, even as he's surrounded by the trappings of his own personal wealth, um, which I he's think very is, much disrupted the whole playbook. I think that's yeah. been, you know, they've been creating for the last thirty years. Mm -hmm. yeah, one of the things that's interesting to me is the fact that he, in, in this photograph, he's overshadowed by all of the trappings of the wealth that he was put out in front of him. I am important because I have all of this stuff. I do all of this stuff, which of course you know, is very exaggerated. But as I look at this photograph, I'm reminded of one of the thoughts I had about the photograph of the eagle, is there's always a backstory. This photograph shows this grandeur. It shows him, you know, commanding an audience. But we also know that they hired a number of people to show up to be in the audience. And you know, so, so all of this is, is some sort of strange fabrication. It's a marketing, it, it was a marketing event as much as a campaign. Yeah, launch. yeah. Todd, we looked at a couple of these photos um, uh, in selecting this one for the edit. And one of the comments I, I made to Michael was, um, that that this shot and then a few of the others you made at the same event have a kind of M.C. Escher quality to yeah, them. Yeah, a sense yeah. of like going yeah. up or down. What's you know it, it's this <laughs> really fascinating visual uh, uh, it's kind of spectacle you know that parallels you know some of what what um, Lorette and Kari were saying about the event itself. But I just want to say I really appreciate the the way the lines in this photo um, you know and the the mirror and all of these kinds of things you captured so nicely, both the constructed nature of um, what this event is, but also, I mean, in some ways, I, I view this photo as a kind of strange preview, <laughs> you know, of what yeah. was to come. Well, you can you know, say in a way that obviously you have no access to while you're making it, but, yeah. but you know, it really just lives in a different way now. You can thank uh, the architects of Trump Tower for that. Um, <laughs> there are also a, a, a numerous, there are many other things that go into this, and, and I think on a general um, campaign photography point, uh, this, this goes to everybody, this isn't just about Trump, they all use the same color blue of the, right. the curtains and the flags and the, and the carpet that he's standing on, mm -hmm. and they, they always create this, this box. And that's where you know the TV, you know, with the TV cameras, or a lot of people, when you're you, you're shooting it head on, you f your your frame fits within this box. Then there's always this blue background with American flags that most of the candidates want to be seen in front of, <clears throat> and or crowds of people. And and a lot of times you'll go to campaign events where, if you see on television by the way it's lit, you'll see a big crowd of people, and and then the background falls off to black, and mm -hmm. But when you enter that campaign event, it's all in the corner of a room, and the rest of the room is empty. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, you, you're, I, I'm always trying to get outside of that blue box and trying to show at least a little bit what's around it to give people some context of, of where where the campaign fits into this little box. But I think Todd, that speaks to your expertise. I mean, and that's why it's so important to have photographers who are confident enough to not be in that photo scrum. We call it you know, elbow to elbow with everybody else in the world, and that they can go out of that scrum and not be afraid that they're going to miss the shot because they have that confidence. And that's why it's so important to have photojournalists, you know, that have experience on staffs at companies and organizations that are creating these images. I just want to, on that point, and, and uh, directly on that point and that idea of the blue box, I wanted to bring in a comment uh, from the chat from Savannah Downing who says, what about the group of people overlooking Trump, kind of his name, the sign, and his body? And so to me, to a certain extent, that, that 
gets at this issue that we're addressing, which is that Todd's been able in this photo to capture what's going on in the blue box and the constructedness of that, and then you have these people kind of, you know, looking over the sign, like, hey, what's going on down there? It gives you a very different impression mm -hmm. uh, of the event. Yeah. Well, and then the edit, right? So the edit where mm -hmm. the, the Secret Service agent is falling, where that glint is just coming between his legs, draws mm -hmm. your eye away from the box and into the periphery. And so that's also a really useful, you know, quote-unquote accident but not, um, and a really great edit. Mm -hmm. The picture that we didn't use, um, which is um, more technical in a way, it's like top-down and is... is very geometric, and this has some of those qualities, but what, what struck me about that picture immediately, and this is, you know, six, again, six months ago or something, was, you know, how much it really created this sense of order and perspective, and, and, and when I see, every time I see that picture now, as the campaign becomes more disordered, and it seems like there's less perspective, I just admire the picture more and more. It seems like we got off on the right foot, and then, oh my God, what happened from there? And that, that your photo, the, and this particularly the other one, the companion photo, reminds me of that whenever I see it. Mm -hmm. This is so gilded too. I lo I just love the gold. I mean, it's it, it just it exudes, you know, like the it, it's so Trump. Well, Major, <clears throat> if if we want to just keep going <laughs> down the rabbit hole here, that's where, that's why we're all here. Um, the, the other interesting note for those for people who who don't live in New York and aren't, aren't familiar with Trump Tower, this this space here was um, designated as public space. Um, mm -hmm. There were there were some discrepancies in terms of how this space would be used. For instance, um, um, you know there was an area where Trump is selling books and ties, and apparently he's not supposed to because that's supposed to be put aside for people to come in and have lunch or whatever. But there are various, uh, you know, corporate towers around Manhattan where they're designated as this quasi-public space where people can go hang out. So this also, you know, adds to how much the campaign landscape has changed. You know, the the idea of the soapbox in the town square and where we gather and where these things happen. Mm -hmm. This is this is, uh, you know, this is the new town square, mm -hmm. so to speak. Mm -hmm. With paid paid participants and and from what I understand, uh, that the people on the mezzanine were his his staff or many of his employees. Is that yeah, true? yeah. I I mean I don't know specifically, but there is a mix. There's a mix of security. There's a mix of staff. Mm -hmm. I would say everybody on the floor, in front of in front of the podium, are all media. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. anybody within that that area on the ground floor and that lower level are mostly media. And is this guy security who's coming down the? He, yeah, he's, I, yeah, he's yeah he's security because nobody else was allowed on the escalator at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tried. <laughs> <laughs> he's sort of like a Trump alter ego too. I, someone in the comments said something that made me think. Oh, uh, Sandra thought that that was Trump, mm -hmm. and then I was thinking like. What if that is Trump? Like it's sort of an alter ego, or he's everywhere, or you know, or it's the, or it's the like the public one versus the like I guess back to that football idea, but that this is more like the security Trump, the like the darker, scary Trump, you know, who's, you know. But I like, like that pen. I bet that pen on his lapel is a is a bust of Trump, wouldn't you think? <laughs> <laughs> Well, maybe we should take a little Trump break, shall we, and move on to a yeah. few other photos. Uh, we've exercised we'll our Trump muscles, off. and we will come back to more of them. Um, uh, uh, so we have this photo. This is also um, what, uh, an early campaign photo, I think even potentially bef before Secretary Clinton announced, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, right after. Or right after. Okay, yeah. so just about a year ago now. Uh, this is a shot from Reuters. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, a very different kind of image than the previous two images that we've engaged. So I'm curious to hear people's thoughts on this. Well, I think that this illustrates the uh, double bind Hillary's put in between the smile and don't smile. Um, every time she smiles, people tend to get this manic version of it and put that, um, you know, in their picture. Uh, so that was the first thing that I thought in terms of, you know, the most recent controversy this week. Well, I would say, um, you know, that it's a, it's a good point that you brought that up, and, and I think 
as somebody who who covered her extensively in 2008 uh, um, for most of, most of her campaign in the primary, um, it it is it is difficult to 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 walk that line of of trying to make. There's there are the images that that you that you can make, and there are images that that you can that you edit and that you put out there and. You know, there's there you you get to know a candidate really really well, and so you know their different expressions, and you know how they look when they enter a room, and and you know this expression here would be something you would see when she en when she enters an event, and you see this expression a lot, and um, you know you're trying to find something different than the three expressions that you see, <laughs> and so it's it, it's a challenge, and and it just and this is where still photography. Um, distills a scene so differently than what you'd see on television because if you watch her walk into a room on TV you don't really notice this expression but when you photograph her you know doing stills this is something that come this expression comes out quite a bit and you know you you have to wrestle with you know you you, you send everything that's good but you also have to wrestle with mm -hmm. you know how you're portraying somebody and I don't care who it is this image to I, me think, seems... I was just going to say, I don't think it's malicious on the intent of. I, I definitely know not on this photographer, but I don't mm -hmm. think it's. I don't think it's a, a something you know that's a malicious intent um, by way of the photographers. Mm -hmm. No way, because photographers are just looking for one moment. I mean, they're praying for something to come up that would yeah. kind of give a little spark to these images because they are so canned in the end. Yeah. They're so constructed and created. And so any spark of any emotion, um, people will, you can hear it in press conferences even, like when someone gestures <clears> with <throat> 5,000 clicks of the camera. I think, I think that is definitely something that we need to talk about as an industry and, and kind of seek to move away from uh, personally. And the next level, though, is the editing. You know, it's, it's what people want to highlight and what they keep showing. Just as, you know, there were a number of people who pointed out that in this past week, what most of the pundits on on broadcast news were pointing out was, was Hillary's uh, voice and, and the way she appeared rather than the substance of what she was talking. So the photographer may see some of the same expressions because that's her personality, but then which pictures are the editors moving uh, so that the public can see them? It's interesting to me that it, that there's kind of a narrative here in our discussion that this is a negative representation of her, and I absolutely get the, the hey, Hillary, smile, don't smile kind of double mind for sure. <coughs> I actually love this photo, and the reason I love the photo in a positive way is the other faces mm -hmm. in this image. I think to me this image is, it, it certainly looks performed and rehearsed to the extent that it's an event and this is somebody who knows events, right, as Todd says. There may be three to four expressions that she you know, uh, exudes in, in any one of these contexts. And to a certain extent the faces of the women, particularly the two behind her, are also a little forced excitement. But in general, um, to me, I view this as a really interesting intergenerational image. I view this as a really interesting, um, uh, you know, if we want to say that Hillary is being criticized for, you know, being too shouty or smiling too big, or, you know, I think of the Amy Poehler characterization of her with the kind of crazy cackle, uh, you know, you know yeah. um, what does it mean that these younger women are doing the same thing, right? So, in other words, there may be a kind of um, opening. Uh, Hillary's the way she's literally placed in the photo. There might be a kind of opening there for a different way of reading her um, and her affect. Well, and Kara, I really agree with that. One thing that I love about the photo is this notion of the coalition of women, as you said, the intergenerational, um, ethnically diverse, diverse in terms of age, uh, and and that's the sort of feminist coalition that Hillary is trying to draw together in her campaign commercials. It's very intentional and it's frankly something that a lot of the media hasn't really picked up on because they've been focusing on how young voters are, are going for Bernie. So, so I totally agree that this photo offers a visual rebuttal to that argument um, to sort of say look at you know who's, who is surrounding Hillary Clinton and it is a diversity of women. Well, as, as a single image, it also makes me, I mean, my first response is there's so much white and blonde. 
<laughs> and, you know, if I were to use that as a microcosm of what her audience is, I'd say, oh, okay, so there's, there's a woman of color there. But is it indeed that white and that blonde uh, everywhere? Um, which, of course, is why we fortunately rely upon more photographs to define how we think and see about things. Because if I only had this photograph to judge, I don't know how I would feel about this candidate. Somebody in the comments, on Axel uh, uh, Horstman said, uh, says Hillary is so controlled that this image of Hillary Clinton for once appears more genuine and in a crowd she feels very comfortable with. Um, and that's an interesting, I think, kind of uh, counterpoint as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I do... Uh, I do think that, you know, that Lorette, your, your comment on kind of who the voters are uh, is an interesting one and it's um, kind of emerging, emerging, in the, um, emerging in the comments of our discussion too. Some of the participants are saying mm -hmm. actually a lot of her vote um, is African American, for example. So if we want to compare this image from a year ago to, uh, mm -hmm. to uh, the demographics of voting, it gets to be more interesting. Um, I, I keep when I when I first saw this photo, I kept wondering if you put a male candidate with that exact same facial expression in the image, how would it change? <laughs> um, I think you would notice the women in a different way, right? Mm -hmm. The younger women behind that person, and so to me, that's interesting as well. That that you can situate this candidate in that context, and it's a slightly different read. Mm -hmm. um, we might say um, other things about this image before we. Uh, before we move on to another Hillary-related image, actually. So maybe we can move back and forth between these if we want to. I was just saying that, you know, we look at so many of, I, images of Hillary, you know, and the campaign every day, and it's really hard to find images that are this animated and also, I know we can argue about it, but also seem that, that genuine. And you, I think that the, if, if you do, do look going forward at the coverage of Hillary, what, what it, we're finding is that and I don't think this is an exaggeration. I think about 80% of the photos you're seeing in the news stream uh, right now or the news wires show her either um, taking a selfie with somebody or <coughs> being like the, the um, you know, or having like people taking uh, uh, p pictures of her with their cell phones. And I think it's sort of like a default that a lot of the photographers are going to because the selfie is so interesting now. But I, I think it also speaks to like how it's hard to capture these pictures of of her in these more genuine moments. I, and I don't have really a good explanation for that. I think some of it, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of it plays into the mechanics of covering a campaign, mm -hmm. especially covering a campaign, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> such as this where she's they're so heavily controlled and have so much security. So you get, you get what you can. And Hillary is, is also, she is very genuine and, and warm when she works the rope line. So that's something, you know, people are going to go after that's going to give you something different from the same, <coughs> same boring campaign speech over yeah. and over and over. You know? <laughs> that you can probably recite in your sleep, right? <laughs> exactly. No, you know, yeah, you hear the speeches so much that you know you'll, sit in, you'll, you'll be sitting down and you'll stop shooting and you can actually you recognize the tenor in their voice and to know that their voice is changing and they're getting ready to wrap up. And you see every photographer start perking up because <laughs> you don't even listen to the words. You just listen to the cadence of their voice. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Like when we were covering Obama, which was the last election that I covered, um, he hit, the great shots for him were always of people looking at him with such yeah. adoration. So we were always trying to get behind him as he was working the lines. Um, we rarely ever got in front because of the way his security detail worked. So you know, this is an interesting thing to think about too. Uh, why don't we move on to the next photo, which um, I think is interesting because it is the first of our photos in the edit, although not the last, that doesn't feature the actual candidate. Um, bodily, and uh, uh, but but obviously uh, pertains very much to conversations happening around the campaign. So I'm curious what folks have to say about this image. Yeah, I think I I, I think this is a great great picture because it you know capture <laughs> for obvious reasons captures you know what's been happening on the Democratic side, and anytime you you know somebody who's out there anytime you can get something like this where the pieces 
fit together like this is mm -hmm. outstanding. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah, I mean, there's the obvious aspect of Hillary is sort of positioned as she's supposed to be the center of the Democratic race, but but Bernie's closing in on her um, as the Hillary supporter seems, you know, stressed out about it. I thought it was interesting that um, as you were as you were talking about Todd, that there's this same shade of blue that that all the campaigns use. I thought it was interesting at how similar those campaign posters looked. Um, and you know, you get the stories uh, in the newspaper about Hillary and Bernie voted together when they were both in the Senate, 93 percent of the time. Um, and so there's this picture I think is is showing the similarities between the candidates um, that we aren't hearing about as much uh, in news narratives that really represent Hillary and Bernie as very very different um, and particularly Bernie supporters I think are invested in seeing their candidate as very very different from Hillary Clinton um, but visually in, at least in terms of colors I think that this message or this photo sends a slightly different message and of yeah, course, I just want to bring in one comment from the participants, uh, Gerardo Moreno, who says, who essentially says, uh, you know, how would the photo be different if the ban campaign banners weren't so similar uh, visually? Yeah. You know, the point, Kari, that you were just making. Yeah. Well, and and the woman's gesture, you know, certainly expresses what we all know is that, that Bernie came as quite a surprise uh, to the slam dunk Hillary campaign. Um, you know, so so it's it it's almost a photographic illustration, though it's not. You know, the, the oh my gosh, you know, Bernie, what do we do about him? I mean, we've been seeing so many headlines that have been saying that they didn't expect Bernie to do as well as he did, or or to put as much pressure on her, and and that's such a clear illustration of that. Yeah, I totally agree. I feel like this is a photo illustration, but not in some ways. And, you mm -hmm. know, as a photo editor, you know, the nuance of her putting her hands on her uh, on her head, you know, it seems to me that she's really just straightening her whatever she has, like straightening yeah. her hair or whatever. Right, right. But we're perceiving it as, oh, I'm stressed out, which is exactly is probably not the case. I mean, she might be, but I don't think that's exactly what she's doing there. Mm -hmm. So there's that nuance of adding that gesture in the image that we publish, and I'm sure there are many other images without that gesture, which takes it into more of an illustrative uh, position for me. I, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I wasn't involved in this editor in any way, but I would love to see the the rest of the take to see, mm -hmm. to see what else, what other expressions he had, and I would also argue that I think the photo would still work without that expression. I think that expression forces it a little bit, but I think mm -hmm. if even if she was just sitting there or even just on her phone, I think I think just having a person in that frame around these signs, having a supporter there works on any level. I totally agree. And like um, if I was editing this, I would probably have opted for a different frame. But yeah. that's just my opinion. But and, things and are much? always crazy with Hillary, you know, you, 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 she's never in the clear, you know, it's like, oh my god, you know, I'm, more, yeah. I'm out in front, but, you know, what's next? Uh, and we, well, and you know, I do have an echo of 2008 there, right, that sense of like, who's this guy Obama, and where did he come from, like, why is this always happening, right? Um, I, I too want, I want to point out that, and I don't know if this um, uh, image Michael might know, or maybe Meg, uh, whether uh, this image was published anywhere else as a news photo, but uh, where it appeared was it was it I think just the online version of a story of, that was really about this kind of generational Bernie Hillary thing with younger women and the the the, the piece the op-ed piece was essentially um, once women get into the workplace and experience sexism in their own lives um, they start to sort of come around to Hillary so there was a kind of argument there that well college women really haven't kind of had that moment yet. Uh, perhaps. And so I, I, to me it was really interesting that, that my recollection from reading the print version, because I'm old school and I read print, is that this photo did not appear in, in that version, I'm not sure. And the fact that this is the online version of that kind of op-ed piece was also really interesting to me um, mm -hmm. as a kind of photo illustration of, you know, so I read it in that context, I read it as like, look at all these men, Bernie, 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 yeah. right? And, oh, yeah. and so there's that kind of uh, frame too, which is a little bit outside of the campaign, but certainly pertinent to it. I think that's an awesome point. Thank you so much for bringing that up. 
Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's amazing. I mean, this couldn't have been styled differently. Look at, you know, the colors that the woman is wearing, and then even the person in the background is wearing red. Um, you know, it, it's, it's all of a piece. Well, and I think it's notable, something that jumped out to me was, it's not the sort of middle-aged, white, blonde, typical Hillary yeah. voter. Um, and to me, what it sort of one of the things that it communicated is a woman who is again frustrated at her perspective or her voice being kind of erased in the conversation. Um, so this notion that uh, the story out there is that Hillary Clinton is is the kind of white feminist for other white feminists, but when you look at the voting patterns, um, she's getting most of the African American vote. She's getting mm -hmm. significant uh, share of the Latina vote. So so that narrative really you know, isn't true, um, and and to me, there's some exasperation about about this voter's perspective being erased by that narrative. Uh, Savannah Downing in the comments um, made a really nice point visually. She said, "Notice how the the giant Hillary sign folds around the woman on the bench." <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in some ways that sort of echoes what Kari was suggesting about, um, you know, uh, that this uh, woman might represent a group of voters whose interests are being addressed differently by candidates, uh, certainly. Yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. And as a photographer, one of the things that this reminds me is, is how often that intuitively I would be drawn to a, a, a picture in a very quick way where I'm taking everything in. And then as I look at it when I'm printing it, I realize all of the different layers that could be interpreted in many different ways. You know, Todd had mentioned, you know, the woman is probably not exasperated but putting her hair back or something like that. But there's a quick read and there's a long read to this photograph. And, and you know, I, I'm often curious about how the public would look at this, whether or not they would see some of the long read uh, interpretation in, uh, of, of the imagery here or whether they have that quick read is oh here's a woman of color who's clearly working for Hillary and you know she's got that that big sign by her and then there's all the little Bernies all around her or, or whether or not they'll start looking at the other layers as well I mean I think it speaks perfectly exactly to what you're saying is that we all bring our gender our race and our level of privilege mm -hmm. into any image we look at and mm -hmm. whatever mental uh, whatever mental filter we're putting on that image, and um, again, a really great, great point. Thanks. Yeah, excellent point. One quick point too, uh, and looking at a lot of campaign images, uh, if we're talking about graphics and uh, typography, um, the signs themselves, it's really interesting how, uh, and you see this in Republicans too, how the Obama <coughs> typography, the um, the the layout, the color, the blue color has just been repeated by everyone and to, mm -hmm. to the extent that everybody wants to get a, away from Obama and the, on the Republicans vilify Obama, it's almost like graphically everybody's like riding his coattails. <laughs> yeah. Exchange the O for the H. Yeah. Well, and you're also, if you look at the type, you've got serif and sans serif, like it's really interesting actually looking yeah. at the type <laughs> treatments. Yeah, and actually, Hillary. If you're going to read this gender in, through a gender lens, Hillary's um, that big arrow pointing into her name <coughs> is a much more yang or masculine kind of treatment, whereas Bernie's got the much more feminine wave, which is really yeah. you know, deep here, guys and gals. Yeah, it's mean. very deep. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like a, I'm cool with that. Yeah, there's yeah. a little yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if this is a, an image that doesn't feature a candidate, but obviously we've had a great discussion about the ways that it reflects issues uh, related to the campaign, um, the next image um, also is an image that is not uh, an image of a candidate per se. Uh, this is um, some work that Darcy Padilla has been doing. Uh, this is part of a series she did in Nevada. So, Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about um, uh, how Darcy's project fits in and where it's been appearing, that kind of thing? Well, there's two things to mention. One is that uh, we didn't see that many images and haven't seen that many images that um, I guess reflect the grassroots. Um, there's so many photographs this year. The proponent of the photographs is about are, uh, at rallies, show the candidates, show the candidates sort of like because these personalities are celebrities. So uh, a, a number of um, 
publications have been using phot photographers, Norman Land, uh, Land, uh, Land, Landman uh, at Time, have been using photographers that aren't traditionally photojournalists or campaign people, and uh, the fact that Lamone is working with, with, uh, with Darcy this year is, is an example of that. So there's that, and then there's also the fact that it is a different kind of photo. It is more of a grassroots photo. And then um, this is a photograph. We had to translate the caption um, because this is a photograph that was um, published abroad. So it's really looking at um, us from the outside. Mm, that's, a, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, to, me, this, okay. to me this contrasted so starkly with the opulence of the Trump photo that we discussed <laughs> earlier, you know, and it's sort of the, um, the real and the unreal in juxtaposition with one another in terms of class in the, in the United States. Well, I think this is this is something that's coming up in this in this this campaign season especially the, the and, and this photograph is the antithesis to that that this this whole campaign as horse race entertainment reality show and the reality is democracy is 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 boring at many times you know it's it's lonely and it's boring and you have these have people out there that are knocking on doors and and doing this really unglamorous stuff and I think you know, it's it's disappointing to hear from your perspective that people just aren't out there covering enough of the of this side of it, mm -hmm. uh, because because you know campaigns are now managed more than they've ever been, and you'll no also notice <clears throat> as the antithesis to this photograph that um, you look at the magazines and look at look at the major publications. I, I'm I'm not seeing very many images that go behind the scenes with candidates. Mm -hmm. So either they're not asking, they're not publications aren't aren't hiring the photographers to do it or the campaigns just simply aren't granting the access. Um, I don't have the an answers there, but, um, you know, I think that's that's also somewhat disappointing. Mm -hmm. You know, Todd, I think it's a little bit of both. I think ca campaigns yeah. aren't allowing and legacy media outlets are drying up. Um, yeah. And ultimately, are the millennials that interested in it? I think everyone's kind of wondering about that and trying to kind of create their coverage around it. Um, and I, I don't know, it's, it's very disturbing to me to see those lack of candid images coming both in the field, like Darcy so beautifully articulates here, and also from behind the scenes. Yeah, we tend to always see the setup uh, situations more rather than the places uh, where democracy is very real. I mean, the things that strike me about this photograph is the fact that the young woman is a young woman, that she's dressed uh, in not really a pop style, uh, not quite alternative or anything like that. The flag is tattered. The house uh, is is ordinary. I, I photographed um, for an entire day uh, in in southern Indiana the first time that Ronald Reagan was elected. And I remember going back and forth all day from the Republican headquarters to the Democratic headquarters. This is Martinsville, Indiana, small town, so the headquarters are very, very small. Very right-wing. Martinsville is known for being very <coughs> right. Um, and, uh, you know, the photographs that I was making were of the, the human beings were showing up on election day, you know, when the polls opened. and. My very last photographs were made in the courthouse on one of the upper floors in one of the courtrooms where there was a Democrat, uh, Democratic uh, representative, a Republican representative, and they were counting paper ballots. And I, I wasn't doing audio then, but I wish I had because I still have the sound in my head where these voices well after midnight were, were, were simply saying, you know, this candidate won, this candidate won, this candidate won, and there was somebody writing it onto these pieces of paper. For me, that, that, that really became a moment when I realized that that's what it all broke down to, is, is People showing up, one person showing up, and that vote counting in some way. Whereas now we see the spectacle. 
we always see the spectacle now, and photographers are limited from photographing some of those behind-the-scenes moments and, and the people being, being ordinary citizens who actually believe in what they're doing. Whether or not it's, mm -hmm. it's valuable, I'm not going to talk about that, but at any rate. Uh, <laughs> there's a really good, uh, I was going to say, there's a really good um, conversation happening in the, in the live chat on some of the symbolic elements of the photo that I think get mm -hmm. at some of the things, Lorette, you and others have been saying. Um, people are talking about, uh, Katie Irwin mentions that, you know, if this is a, a if mm -hmm. this is a photo that's primarily been seen by an audience outside the U.S., then the tattered flag perhaps mm -hmm. looks different. Mm -hmm. um, maybe it might reflect, uh, you know, a, a global viewer might uh, be a little worried about what's happening in the United States right now yeah. and maybe bring that frame. Um, uh, but people are pointing to, I think, some really interesting specific visual elements of the, of the photo, too. So maybe we could kind of come back in and say, you know, if, if other photos aren't showing this, what is Darcy showing us here, Darcy Padilla, that other people that maybe we aren't seeing um, in some of these other kinds of uh, images. Mm -hmm. Well, it also makes me think about whether or not Donald Trump would be this successful without being such a reality TV icon, you know? Uh, and yeah, I mean, in a weird way, that keeps coming up with me. Are these the households that are watching this television and thinking, God, I want to be that boss, and I want to fire people, and I want to make millions of dollars. I mean, it goes back to the Trump Tower photo and this projection, mm -hmm. um, but that's just me projecting onto the image, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, I really am looking at the live chat. I really appreciate uh, Christine's and Sarah's uh, or Sandra's comments um, about the the this view of America comes as a surprise or that this view of America comes as a surprise says a lot about the narrative of recovery from 2008 um, and the condition of the house is care, sidewalk, and even the weather echoes the flag. Um, and I think that that's interesting as well, um, this notion of, well, t for example, today or a couple days ago with um, David Brooks's uh, editorial uh, sort of excoriating Trump but saying, Hey, you know, I under I didn't understand the situation of his supporters. Uh, the, you know that the real economic uh, situation that they are in because I don't talk to those people. I don't hang around those people. I don't see those people. Um, <clears throat> so this is making that element of the campaign, you know, more visible than it's usually been made. And one of the things that that I'm totally aware of in this photograph is is the fact that there are no voters present except for this young woman who is trying to, she likely is a voter, but she's trying to get other voters involved. I mean, this, <laughs> it's the absence of people who might care about what she's handing out, who might care about the election or the candidate. It's the absence of a lot of things that, that actually create the ideas behind the photograph. Mm -hmm. Um, in commit, possibly committing a, a grand act of overreading. Um, on that point, I want to point out that there appear to be two satellite dishes on the roof of the house, and mm -hmm. they're pointed away <laughs> from uh, from our campaign worker on the street. <laughs> you know, are we paying more attention to the media uh, uh, in our homes than than the nice neighbors uh, who would like to talk to us about politics? I don't know. <laughs> well, I was thinking about the Trump photo where, <clears throat> and we I think we just touched on it, but. At his foot was the painting of uh, Trump, and so you had that kind of the narciss narcissus effect. And this couldn't be further from 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 that at all. In a way, uh, you know, there's it's right. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm yeah, this is sort of like it's it's polar opposite. Mhm. Mm you know, good question is I can't read her T-shirt, but I'm wondering who she's campaigining for and. Um, uh, Haley, she's a Sanders uh, supporter. Yeah, I think it's a Bernie shirt. Is yeah. it? So yeah. Haley, th thanks for pointing that out. She asks, you know, what does yeah. this picture tell us about Bernie Sanders? I think that's a yeah. really good point. Right, right. Good, good point. Thanks, Haley. And that would be a neighborhood where his supporters would would feel that they can get some support. Mm -hmm. well, I think you could take take. Um, <clears throat> this is a common this this type of image or this situation is. It's something that I've photographed quite often, and it's something that we always, you know, it's one of the elements of, of covering a campaign that you step into. And 
you know, I would argue that you could take any any one of these photographs from any one of these situations and and you know from from any different neighborhood and you could read into them, you know, um, infinitely because you know you're looking at the way people live and you're looking at the way mm -hmm. uh, you know the neighborhoods where people are campaigning and you know they they can be so different depending on you know where where you know what party is campaigning where. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think um, it, I'm gonna invite us to move on now to the next photo, which um, brings us to, uh, uh, you could say, uh, uh, another mm -hmm. local context, although a local context with extreme importance um, mm -hmm. uh, nationally right now, uh, and that is, um, this is a photo from uh, by Mike Thompson uh, from the Detroit Free Press uh, on demonstrators outside of a democratic debate in Flint. Um, and and uh, as the caption tells us, they're holding up photos of Flint children affected by the water crisis. So again, here another example of an image without a candidate that's very much tied up with the the um, issues and topics of the campaign. Mm -hmm. Thoughts or feedback on this image? Yeah, Michael, you maybe good image when there's that pause, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, no, Michael. What, what was your thinking in the, with this photograph? Uh, actually, um, we added this photo really late, and uh, we were thinking that again, we were seeing a lot of Im images of of candidates and rallies, and in fact, and it was Meg Handler's idea. Uh, she said, "You know, what we're looking at is mostly national press and newswire." What, what we need to go back and take another pass through um, local media, uh, and so she started doing that. And and I think one of the first places she went was um, uh, w looking at Detroit and looking at Flint. And um, and this picture came up, and it really did um, go the other way. It was really about like a a local issue, local concern. It felt like here's an instance where. Um, you see the, uh, the the people's voice, or you see almost like you know rhetoric from 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 the ground, um, and it was just it was so unusual because we've seen very little of that kind of a, a photograph. One thing that's implicit in the picture of the kids is this is a picture about a policy issue, not about patriotism, um, and so much. Um, especially candidate images tend to be about either patriotism or our view of the president, what a president should look like or sound like. Um, and so buried in this photo is the implication that politics are fundamentally about policy and policy affects people. Actually, that was the other point. Like I was talking to Nina Berman also this week and before we made started looking further and she was saying, in the old, in the past, you would have the campaign would spur um, media to basically do a lot of issue um, uh, stories mm -hmm. that were linked to there were policy stories that were linked to the campaign. And she mm -hmm. said, "You don't see any of that anymore." So that's what makes this really rare, also. Because uh, thanks policy, policy is too divisive, right? For for our national politics now, hmm. if you get into any policy issue, it's divisive, and so candidates who don't go there are more successful at the level of the presidency at least. Well, and media and the public focus more on personality now. Mm -hmm. you know, I, that's one of my frustrations is, is we're looking at personality, we're looking at style, we're looking at all sorts of things. You know, which makes me also look at this photograph and I looked at it, I wondered who they were presenting these photographs to. <laughs> right, and I want to yeah. know what the connection is between the people presenting the photographs and the children depicted yeah. in the imagery because yeah. I'm telling you yeah. what, if those were my children in Flint, I would not have this kind of unaffected, kind of disconnected, um, mm -hmm. emotional affect on my face. So I'm curious about that, that background too. So I there's a, would, um, I was just going to say there's a link. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, sorry, I see the just link quickly, some too. background. There's a link in the um, in the uh, participant chat about this project. Mm -hmm. 
about this project, uh, which says husband and wife educators and photographers Andrew Krupp and Pamela Bratton Wallace Krupp of Rochester, Michigan, are collaborating with 15 other metro Detroit area photographers on Voices Seen, Voices Heard, the Children of Flint, a photo project to highlight the children of Flint at risk of lead poisoning. Um, the project was on display outside the Democratic debate um, in Flint. So that provides a little bit of context. Um, so I apologize for whomever I just cut off. <laughs> um, yeah, I was going to say <clears throat> this This uh, actually contrasts or you can compare with the, the one situation with Carly Fiorina. Um, I believe it was in Iowa. I sent you guys a link here. Mm -hmm. uh, where she was at a library and essentially co-opted a field trip and made the kids part of part of her um, campaign speech. It was an anti-abortion speech, and the, uh, some of the parents that were interviewed were quite upset about it. Um, this is obviously a very different context because these kids were photographed, and I'm, I'm assume they they knew what they were being part of. But it's interesting to see the way. Um, people that might not necessarily have a say in this are co-opted for these political agendas. Well, and this, this is an especially cynical interpretation, and I don't want to attribute that. Yeah. You know, yeah. journalists have a problem yeah. with that. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, no, I mean, I, I, what I'm about to say is a cynical interpretation, um, okay. and, I don't wanna, and I don't want to attribute that to either Bernie supporters or the journalist, but... Um, I think it's hard to, you know, in the context of this campaign, it's hard to get around the fact that most African American, uh, Democratic Af African Americans are voting for Hillary Clinton. Um, and so to have some white uh, Bernie supporters saying, hey, we're going to speak, you know, on behalf of these black kids, um, I think that's a, a cynical interpretation of that would be to suggest that they're, um, that they are sort of align with with residents of Flint um, more than Hillary Clinton or better more effectively than Hillary Clinton um, which I don't think you know the the voting pattern at least bears out um, so that's an interesting dynamic as well in these pictures and I think it's tricky it's always tricky when when race is implicated in any way in, in a photograph um, mm -hmm. but I I do think that we can't get away from the utility of this visual narrative for the Sanders campaign in trying to directly address one of the, his biggest weaknesses. This is a case too I think where captioning can be complicated because the caption that we have for the photos is demonstrators outside the Democratic debate. Uh, the, the kind of backstory to the link from the free press, uh, the headline is protesters, uh, and, and, and so it's difficult to know what this group of people is. Um, is it the one guy that wore the Bernie hat? Is it a group of Bernie supporters? Uh, is it people who are working for this photo project trying to raise the issue more broadly? Um, yeah, I think it's really complicated to try to figure out. Um, I do find, I mean, one of the, visually, one of the things that I think connects with some of the things you've all been saying about the, about the context here, um, uh, the barrier, and then the children's photos kind of being held up on top of the barrier and from the barrier, to me that's interesting in the context of how much we do or don't pay attention to policy and how much uh, politicians in general may be recognized as paying attention or not to issues like this. And, and so to me, for that, that juxtaposition of the faces of children in the photos with you know, that very standard barrier that they put up at all of these kinds of events is a little jarring. Um, and, it, and it may kind of connect to some of the um, uh, racial components of the photos, as Kari was suggesting, too. So a comment from India Lovato, I'm sorry, I'm just fascinated with this one, um, which really just hit me, is that they do remind of the in-memoriam photographs that you would see at funerals, basically. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Uh, I think that's a really great read, uh, India, and thanks a lot. You want to read her comment, Judy? Uh, yeah. yeah, India said, it's interesting how the photo within the photo seems to erase the context of the original photographs of the children, which read like portraits outside of this context, but perhaps can be read in as in memoriam kinds of photographs here. What is the consequence of this? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really, a really good point. Um, 
I don't know if this is reaching, but another thing that struck me looking at the photo too is the a jersey, the Cleveland jersey. And of course, you know, LeBron James and NBA and all of that sports permeates culture. And But, um, you know, it is about, uh, there's Cleveland. Now we're talking not just Flint, and now we're talking about Cleveland. And I don't know then how that kind of um, echoes also, you know, race or not, or just it has to do with, um, you know, er uh, uh, urban concerns or, or just our cities or, you know, multiple cities. But, you know, it starts to talk about, you know, more, more issues uh, that are affecting us uh, in terms of, you know, the country and, and, and the cities than just the particular crisis in Flint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. A couple of the comments, I've, I've now lost it because the feed's been very active and it's moving up and down to my mm -hmm. screen, but, uh, but one of the commenters pointed out that there's a real contrast between the faces of the um, uh, people holding the photographs and the faces of the children in the photographs, um, which, which gets at that kind of, I think, juxtaposition of, um, of purposes, perhaps, right, in the context of a portraiture project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other Katie things Irwin. about this image. I just Katie Irwin texted um, Cleveland arrow Tamir Rice. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. To the extent that there are bigger structural issues behind what's going on in Flint, um, I did also want to point out that um, in the uh, somebody passed on a note, uh, Casey McGinnis. Uh, about this issue of who's doing policy work, visual policy work right now. Um, uh, and Casey wrote, David, David Guttenfelder is doing an issue slash policy series on Instagram mm -hmm. for National Geographic in Florida. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe if Phil or somebody can find a link to that, we could pop that up too. But that's, um, again, gets at that issue of um, how to depict policy. And Kari, your point about how policy is now the most divisive thing. Uh, you know, policy used to be the place where we would say, let's all focus on the issues and not the personalities. And now policy itself has become um, even more divisive, perhaps. Well, and that's in part because voters are disincentivizing compromise. I mean, there's research that says we voters used to incentivize and reward compromise on both sides of the aisle. And voters are doing that less now, particularly on the Republican side of the aisle. Um, so you can't. And, and virtually every policy accomplishment in politics is compromise. Um, so you see can candidates and potential candidates wanting to de-emphasize uh, compromises that they've made. Yeah, yeah, particularly in primary season. Right. Yeah. Why don't we move on to the next image? Um, uh, this um, brings us back to Trump land. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so we've looked at a few images that are more about um, uh, the campaign and issues facing the campaign and people uh, working for the campaign, and, and, and now we're back in the context of that very, very kind of traditional mainstream media uh, coverage of the spectacle. Uh, and so uh, this is an image from August, uh, a, a Trump rally. Um, a lot to talk about here, uh, a, a very populated image, we might say. So what are some thoughts on this? Well, I mean, I, I think the obvious uh, is this notion that the photo um, is, is either highlighting an inconsistency among social conservatives, particularly evangelical Christians who support Trump, um, and, and sort of making them look and seem manic, um, or and or making them look and see at least um, foolish uh, in their support. Um, so that's kind of the most obvious thing with the woman's expression. Uh, the woman holding the baby. <clears throat> I should also note that I obviously wasn't at this rally and can't, can't say for sure about this specific occasion, but many times <laughs> at campaign events I've watched uh, campaign workers hand out signs that have been pre-made Mm. and give them to supporters. So you, you, I don't necessarily trust any sign that I see in an audience at a campaign event. Mm -hmm. right. No matter how homemade it might look. Yeah, yeah, they're usually handwritten. They're very planted. Like yeah, very this, this one has that style. It's, it's, the penmanship is very nice. 
Um, but also but, the way you know, Lord. I wasn't is there. I can't, new, I can't corroborate this. Specific one. Yeah. I, I just want to note in the comments section, um, a couple of commenters, uh, Andrea yeah. Terry and Savannah Downing, have pointed out that because of the way the red and the blue are written, it looks like it reads Lord President Trump. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, which is certainly an yeah, interesting, a great, great observation kind of thing. Yeah, well, and it's funny. This might be getting it sort of in in the weeds of evangelical culture, but you know, you hear this discourse of um, Democratic candidates, specifically Barack Obama, emerging as an antichrist figure. That that um, people on the right have called him an antichrist figure. Um, I think Donald Trump might be functioning if if. If you had a, a person on the right who could be characterized as an antichrist by his political opponents, um, Donald Trump would be an awfully good uh, candidate for that. The, um, the, this image seems to have a lot of the, I guess, um, stock topics that we're seeing in these kinds of rally photos now. Um, uh, Primarily, I would say the presence of the phone uh, and you know the camera on the phone uh, as as being a part of the experience um, and and that rep that repetition of the phones um, it's kind of a where's Waldo thing for me once I look at this photo and start to pay attention to the phones, all I see are phones <laughs> um, and and more phones mm -hmm. What about body in this image? In all I can see is the race in that crowd and the lack of diversity um, and the desperation which I think is one reason why Trump is you know doing so well mm -hmm. what about Trump's body in this image this this seems to me um, to be different from the way we usually see him visually represented mm -hmm. yeah it's definitely not the polished business leader presentation. I mean, he looks, you know, kind of out of shape and a little slumped and um, and I I mean, I think his his red hat was obviously designed to to stick out and look sort of out of place, but I think it's a comical juxtaposition of his business suit and this ridiculous red hat that he would have never worn, you know, before this this campaign. He, you'd never see Trump in a baseball hat. Um, so that just illustrates kind of the all right, Trump is putting putting on a, a costume right now um, and people are responding to it or at least to his celebrity. I'm worried he's going to drop that baby. <laughs> he's not looking at the baby, right? He's looking past the baby. <laughs> the baby the baby looks like the baby's worried that he's going to drop the baby. <laughs> it, it, maybe I'm too much of a social media junkie also but um, there was a uh, Photoshop version of this that came out, like, I don't know, within hours. And what the person did, and we, were, we were actually looking for the link, we can't find it, but, um, is they took the picture, the, the face of the woman, um, that kind of crazy expression, and they replicated that face on everybody in the crowd. <laughs> oh, wow. And not only t terrifying in terms of sort of like the, the just mania, but it also raises the issue of, of gender also, you know, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think this is August, September, I don't know if this is yeah, before, August. like, the dust up with Megyn Kelly and the whole, you know, thing about menstruation and everything, but, you know, the, 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 the fact that, and, the, and then also, like, two or three days ago, there was this, like, really disturbing um, slideshow that Reuters did on Trump's women, and it just showed, like, all this, you know, like, so similar kind of affect, um, uh, but it you know the whole gender issue too is also like concerning. I think this this is when I first became more aware of it was from this one photo. Mm -hmm. Well, and if you look even at the just in the photo edit that you've selected for this um, discussion, when women women are either in the picture as overwhelmed or kind of manically excited. Um, you know, in the, in the photos we've discussed so far, or they're absent. Um, so we don't see uh, as many just sort of pensive female voters or thoughtful female male voter, voters as we see a, a variety of expressions for the male voters who are included. Huh. Yeah, I was thinking if you took the, the, the face of the woman in pink and put her into the photo of Hillary with the younger women, it wouldn't look out of place. 
necessarily. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It would have that same kind of, I'm really excited to be here with this celebrity or famous person or, you know, someone I admire, whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, yeah. And it is, um, that's really, to me, this photo is really about her face. Um, more than anything else, and Michael's suggestion of the meme. And it looks like um, Phil has put up a link, and I just want to note that the end of the URL is Trump rally crazy lady face swap meme. <laughs> which, well, you have to be uh, pretty strong uh, to get uh, up to the front of that line, you know? So, I mean, people that, that you got to sharpen your elbows and bang your way up <laughs> to the to that line. So I, I would say right. that probably more normal focus people will not be along that, that area to right. meet the candidate. And if you have a baby dressed in what looks like blue with white stars or something, right, even, yeah, even better? A flag, baby. There was an interview with that woman, and she actually wasn't a Trump supporter. I don't, unfortunately, I don't remember the backstory, and I, I didn't have, we were traveling last night, so I didn't have time to look it up. But one of the things that I was struck by in the interview is her face gives us one message and what she actually said in the interview was an entirely different thing. And it seems that so many of Trump, the pictures of Trump are like that. Is is you can't just believe what you're seeing in the photograph. I'm thinking about Todd's point in, in when we talked about his image of the uh, of the Trump Towers announcement where Todd you pointed out that you know when you cover these events there's they're really kind of actually in a relatively small space and you don't see that because of the structured nature and, and so I'm finding myself looking at the far boundaries of this image which um, yeah again appears to be inside of a stadium so yes there appear to be a lot of people there but the image the way it's cropped on the top gives you a sense of the, that it is in fact a bounded group of people um, and in some ways that brings me back to especially some of the visual coverage of Obama which would um, you know highlight the extent to which the crowd seems to go on forever. Right. Right. And that's what I loved so much about Todd's photo in the beginning of the talk today. Whereas he actually pulled back from that scrum, you know, and kind of gave us a, a more interesting overall of the scene. And I appreciate that. How about we move on to um, this next image, which I was um, uh, Someone in the chat actually asked, are we going to talk about this image and then described it? And so here it is indeed. So obviously this is an image or images like this image um, for many people have, have come to embody something about the campaign or, or about Trump or both. A, a quick thing to mention is that this photo was, and if you're a, a photojournalist on the trail, this is like very, very clear to you that Everybody took this picture. That's what they say when you talk to a photographer. Everybody, that, yeah. everyone got that. And, uh, and so this is Patrick uh, Fallon's version for Bloomberg. But it, it and I think because there's only certain places people go, or there's, you know, the, this was very accessible. Um, this image, but to me also because of how widely circulated it was in its different, you know, incarnations, it also in some way to me has been. Like, and I, you know, you've got to be careful using that term. It's overused too, but it's kind of an iconic image of this campaign. It's, I think, it's probably the one. Thinking back to 2012, or, I mean, 2016 is the one that I'm, I'll, I'll remember. Maybe the one that will come up first in my head. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know um, um, what made you choose this photograph over some of the many others that were that were filed <laughs> from this exact same scene. Ouch. Um, oh no, I, no, it's not a criticism. I'm just curious because they're, you know. Mm -hmm. They all have different connotations. There was one that was shot at dusk with some bluish light, mm -hmm. and you can see that it was lit. And you know, anyway. Yeah, the ones that were shot at night actually were interesting too, because you know, with those three very large lamps, mm -hmm. um, it does feel like either an outdoor movie or you know, it, it, it's it's really like a, a you know billboarded. But um, I think we liked this one. First of all, there was nobody else in it. There were other mm -hmm. other pictures of people taking photographs of it, but if there's something more barren about this one, something colder, mm -hmm. something more desolate uh, uh, about it. Um, and, um, but I mean, there are other versions I, I, you know, I liked a lot as well. So it, it, in a way, maybe that it was a little bit of a random choice too. 
Well, in this image, too, I think partially because of the lighting and the angle, it looks like Trump is just kind of popping up from behind <laughs> the fence. Um, where the other ones, it looked it looked less active and 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 more sort of integrated into the scene. I really like the addition of the trees in the background, kind of mm. the desolate, kind of dead of winter feel, and the snow in the foreground. I think Patrick did a great job. It's almost like a nightmare, like you just opened up your eyes after you passed out in the snow, and there he is. <laughs> I love that. I love that image. Like, what have you been doing in Des Moines? Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, it, it's also an image where it appears to be snowing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, it, you know, winter's coming. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's hard not to want to kind of uh, introduce all kinds of metaphorical uh, readings here. Um, several people have pointed out in the comments that, that that perspective shot from the ground, as Lorette pointed out, um, uh, gives Trump a kind of prominent, perhaps sinister quality in the way that Taji suggested. He's just come up over the fence. Mm -hmm. um, and there is also kind of, for me, I think that there's this, this question of, um, I guess, class, right, that has hovered over a lot of these images in different ways. Um, and, and here, I think, you know, why, are, why has this become a, quote, pilgrimage place? Um, maybe, you know, why is this something that would draw photojournalists in particular? That perhaps the juxtaposition between the, you know, the ordinary house with the fence that you know may or may not need a little work, um, uh, and and the image and the image that Trump represents. So so that visual juxtaposition obviously is just kind of candy, uh, eye candy to anybody who wants to um, play with that and and construct their own image to a certain extent. Um, I want to point out in the comments that several links to um, stories using other versions of these images are popping up, or also yeah. stories about the fact that people are um, uh, making pilgrimages to this place. <laughs> well, the other good point that came up in the chat too of people talking about the meta, the uh, the comparisons to wall to the walls to the border wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think you, yeah, you see that here more than in like the one shot at night, which are more about um, him mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. to a certain I thought, extent. I thought it was interesting, and this is does not speak so much to the composition of the photo, but the that the Trump supporter chose that image of Trump to be the one to blow up and put in his, his yard. Um, I think that suggests the extent to which, uh, you know, emotion from male candidates is seen as, as less problematic than emotion from female candidates. I mean, imagine if we had a b giant picture of Hillary Clinton's head when she's, you know, testifying before the Benghazi hearings or something and got very emotional, that would not be something that her supporters would likely choose as a favorable reflection of her image. But yeah, I agree. That this I think that's a great point and yeah. really yeah. appreciate you bringing that up. And you can just hear him saying that you're fired in that <laughs> image. You know, I think that is definitely uh, a resonating situation with a lot of things I see in the Trump imagery. Right. And, I mean, in that, that's where it comes together with the importance of the fence image. Like, yeah, the, the Trump voter wants an angry president be mm -hmm. behind our fence keeping everybody out. And, and I love that. You're, you're right, too, Kari, about if that had been uh, Hillary uh, Clinton uh, coming from the fence and her mouth was open, you know, and she's speaking, no matter where she is, whether it's Benghazi hearings or even, you know, one of the photographs that, that we've seen recently, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, there she is, she's talking all the time, telling us stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the same thing that we've always had about, you know, women are bitchy when they're like that, but, you know, he's really amazing. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a technical question, but um, we, since we have several accomplished photojournalists on the panel, I'm going to ask it. Um, there's something about the depth of field happening in this particular photo, and I wonder if any of you can explain it to me, that visual effect where, um, to a certain extent, and different from some of the other images of this scene, the house and especially the fence almost look miniaturized. Yeah, this was, this was shot at a very wide aperture, probably 1.4 at a very low angle with maybe a 50 millimeter lens, 35, okay. something like that. Yeah, and so, so, so why would a photographer make that choice? Um, um, I mean, am I right in my interpretation that there's a kind of toy-like or miniature kind of quality? 
Yeah, yeah, it certainly gives it gives it that quality. I think it separates something from the background um, mm -hmm. because you have that low depth of field, that that center plane. Yeah, there may have been houses or other things in the background, and by by coming really low, what Todd just said trends happened, and things that, that come up. It out. I'm sorry, I kind of cut you off. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. No, what well, what, what did you say? I didn't hear what you said. Oh well, what I was saying. I'm sorry. We were having some some uh, internet problems. Uh, by by moving really low, the photographer gets rid of the busy background that could have shown other houses. You know, maybe there was a factory there. Maybe there were big power lines there or something. And so by by getting really low, you clean up the background, and because you're close to the ground, that is much, much larger in, in your field of view, a uh, function of being at the perspective as well as the lens that you're using. And, and so the house is sharper, and that's the point of focus, and it does seem smaller in relation to the thing in front of your nose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is more Sorry, like a, a more emotional kind of in, a take on the same point is, you know, we're when you talk about anger, you can you have this is some more psychological thing, but you, you know there's two forms of anger. We tend to only identify with one, which is the you know hot, but you know cold anger, a cold mad is just as you know as and probably actually is much more common in terms of human behavior. So by putting us into the snow, you know we really get like the full dimension of you know what I think Trump's channeling, which is you know, a anger that's like latent and anger that, you know, much more rarely actually is more manifest. And this, and so this puts you into, gives you both. Mm -hmm. That's a really, that's a really interesting read. Mm -hmm. um, it also, so, some people in the uh, comments have been pointing out that um, Trump is actually behind the wall <laughs> uh, in this but, case. But he still rises. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so and 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 so thinking about the projection of that anger, uh, and you know maybe then where the viewer is in position, um, right, um, to where he is behind the fence or the wall, um, you know somebody in the comments, uh, Christine says it that makes us small and distant by implication, right? We're just this tiny little speck down there on the outside mm -hmm. <laughs> um, of whatever's going on behind that fence, perhaps. But then he also is the alter ego of all of these people, you know, the, this supposed like silent majority, you know, because he's really there. He's 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 their projection. Um, exactly. and, and I think that's exactly what the, we see with the house. Yeah. Is that what's exactly that angry right? white man man? <laughs> that yeah, great, you know, movie. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. The um. Uh, I think we can move on to the next image now, which um, is also Trump-related, um, but might not initially appear that way um, at first glance. Uh, this is, a, a, I think, the most recent image in the edit from uh, a little over a week ago uh, at the tr planned Trump rally uh, at the University of Illinois Chicago Pavilion, um, where Trump elected not to show. Uh, because of the uh, uh, protesters, and there's a lot of dispute in the city of Chicago about whether the police told Trump to cancel, which is what Trump's campaign communicated, and the, then the police, Chicago police are saying, no, actually, we didn't tell him to cancel. We actually do events like this all the time. So there's a lot of dispute about the, the facts on the ground, as we say, but um, one of the first things that strikes me about this image is its juxtaposition to the image of the baby in that rally. Um, in terms of the crowd, the composition of the crowd, um, uh, certainly differences, but also some similarities in terms of the presence of social media, the, um, uh, the uh, energy level of the crowd as well. Um, but, but this image certainly marks a real turn uh, in, in the campaign in a way that um, maybe some of the other images we've talked about uh, that are older don't really quite capture yet. Well, Kara, you were talking about the this juxtaposition next to the rally with the baby. The, uh, they're very different time frames, though, too. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and most of these people 
in this photograph are all college students who didn't want the Trump rally, and they're expressing their their disapproval. As for the Trump people saying, well, you know, no, the police told us, you know, they've been doing that for months now, going back and forth. This happened, no, that happened. And the authorities will say one thing and they'll say another thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but nobody seems to care about that. One thing that I thought was, that I really liked about this image is to me it reads as, the new democratic coalition. I mean, one one of the narratives that's emerging mm. right now is how um, political coalitions may be about to go through a big shift with respect mm. to gender and ethnicity um, as it relates to Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And right now, you know, the love Trump's hate is was Hillary Clinton's anti-Trump slogan. Um, and then we've got the Bernie supporter um, mm -hmm. with the Bernie sign there. And I think it's a prelude to this could be a very formidable coalition if it coalesces, mm -hmm. which is why um, some conservatives are working very hard to make sure not only that Donald Trump doesn't get nominated, but that this coalition doesn't coalesce. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting that you point that out because even in the image, you know, if you look at the various t-shirts and things people are wearing and mm -hmm. obviously the sign, you can see the hints of that, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, there's a Black Lives Matter t-shirt, um, uh, we mm -hmm. have women um, uh, wearing hijabs, we have the Bernie sign, we have a woman at the top with the red hair who yeah. is wearing a t-shirt yeah. that has a kind of feminist theme. Mm -hmm. um, so the image, yeah, it really performs that and you, it, it's not like a bunch of groups that are separate are kind of doing their own thing and happen to be in the same space. There's very much mm -hmm. a kind of collaboration and, and the moment they're they're celebrating is the moment where they've realized that Trump is not coming. Uh, yeah. and, and so right. the, the, the folks at UIC are viewing this as a victory. Um, what struck me when Michael and I talked about this image, I said, you know, this could be a photo from 2008 Barack Obama rally. Mm -hmm. If you take out that Trump and that Bernie sign, mm -hmm. it would be really hard to tell um, what mm -hmm. this is. Maybe um, slightly fewer cell phones then, <laughs> but, uh, but the emotional quality of that photo is this photo is really interesting. Again, the diversity, the racial diversity, the gender diversity, um, the ethnic diversity that's playing out here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, very different from that earlier Trump rally photo, certainly. Well, plus it's also so great that you don't see the the manic kind of need to be near the candidate. It, this is like a really just an overall great image of a group of people that succeeded and it's not focusing in on a single person necessarily um, other than getting rid of Trump. More of a movement. There's another interesting detail to this um, when you look at the the signs, the Bernie sign and the, the tr love Trump's hate. You see how they've, they've all been folded up because these are people who obviously mm -hmm. snuck these signs into this rally. Mm -hmm. So it's another interesting you know, you, you look for any kind of historical markers that will that will remind you of a certain time as you move years past this election cycle, and, and this is that's a nice little you know anthropological detail. Mm -hmm. That's a really really but interesting point because I had actually been wondering why is the Bernie sign all crumpled up? But of course that makes total sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to point out in the comments yeah. um, just to point out in the comments. Um, XL Horstman, who's uh, participating in the live chat, uh, was there inside and so um, is talking a little bit about uh, some of the things um, at the rally. Um, uh, uh, XL says they literally erupted in joy when the announcement of cancellation was made. It was an insane evening. Um, never saw something like that before. Uh, so um, uh, a, a kind of inside account of what's going on inside. And I know Meg Handler, our editor, was actually outside posting some pictures from uh, the protesters gathered outside the UIC pavilion as well. I think, um, and it goes to a point I was I was going to make, or a question I was going to ask. Savannah Downing brought up Trump's tweet about this, which said, um, why is it that the horrendous protesters who scream, curse, punch, shut down roads, doors during my rallies are never blamed by media? Sad. So I think it's really important to, to note how these, mm -hmm. how, how different people read the same images depending on their political beliefs. And so this same image could be read a, a totally different way, which was, oh, it, these people were sent by Bernie Sanders, um, you know, the Black Lives Matter people are thugs, whatever. I'm just taking whatever rhetoric has been thrown thrown about here. So 
you know, two people can look at this picture very differently. And mm -hmm. I think you always have to remember that in looking at political events, but also political photographs, you know, and while, while you might think of an image demonizes a, a candidate or a subject, um, the other side might look at that as a championing, championing the, the candidate or subject. Yeah, th this photo has got to be completely incendiary to Trump followers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and that, that kind of goes back to the coalition issue in that before what the Democratic Party used to do, I mean, you know, generally, was nominate a, a man, well, usually a white man, almost almost every time, except for with Obama, you know, but at least a man. And and right now they're saying because they could count on the votes from women and people of color in the Democratic uh, Democratic race. But what what they're saying now is, hey, maybe we can do this without white men at all. Um, if we get enough of these other types of people to work together, we can do this without white men. So it's this notion of we're going to chase this white man off the, the scene. And there certainly are a few uh, white men in that picture, um, namely the one who's holding the Love Trumps Hate sign. But, but it's mm. this notion that, okay, fine, if you're going to ignore our issues, we can actually do this without you now. Um, and that's a very, that's an incendiary prospect. Yeah. Really good point. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I'm interested too in thinking about the generational component of that um, uh, as well, right? Because this image, uh, uh, again, in the context of uh, what's going on in Illinois higher education, being at, uh, down down the road from UIC, I have a kind of sense of that, and and this uh, there's there's a kind of don't come to our campus, which is extremely diverse uh, and full of a lot of um, very high achieving first generation college students from all backgrounds. Um, don't come to our campus with, uh, with your rally. Uh, and, and so there's certainly a unifying force there, but there is also a kind of generational moment happening here um, that perhaps was unexpected, um, certainly by Trump. But, in the sense that in 2008 there was a lot of conversation about Obama bringing young people in, and then in 2012, well, they didn't show up. Um, uh, and then today, in my local paper, the, the newspaper, shocked by the number of um, votes uh, this last week coming out of the campus districts here in town. Mm -hmm. And wow, we didn't expect that. Well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Why didn't you expect it? Mm -hmm. and, and maybe it relates to some of these broader shifts, Kari, that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. There's been so much cynicism this year and so much um, focus on Trump and divisiveness. Um, I, and I, I think I mentioned like the, that kind of echo of Obama in, the, in the, the coloration and the typography of these signs. But, you know, this picture is, this is hope again. This is, it, maybe, maybe the p people from the right wouldn't say that. They would say this is more like triumphalism for, for disruption and they would see this as subversive. But, you know, it, it, depending on your view, but I think we see like a this is there's also joy there's 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 hope there even if it's just to like you know close this rally down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, why don't we move on to um, the the uh, final photo in the edit, which um, might lead us. We can talk about the image uh, first, but then it might lead us perhaps into a broader conversation. Uh, about what we might expect to see in the in the coming months uh, as we transition um, to a general uh, uh, to a general election. So this is a photo actually that goes back to September, uh, and and this is a, a an image from Melina Mara that um, uh, was shot at the uh, uh, HRC headquarters in Brooklyn. So. Just two quick things. One is it was taken off Instagram, um, so I don't think it was circulated um, uh, in the traditional media or in, in the post. Mm -hmm. um, and I love Melina Mara. She's a fantastic photographer. Um, and the other thing is that it's the date again, because this was September very early on, um, and Trump was not Trump yet. Uh, but mm -hmm. the fact that, and it could be just random that this was so prominently displayed in the Clinton headquarters before the first 
GOP debate, but mm. it makes you wonder, was he on their radar, or is that something, you know, we just read in now because we know what happened? Um, and then I think it's also an amazing kind of way to handicap, you know, it's kind of, kind of going forward. The arrow kind of says that, like kind of what's next, even though this was taken, you know, way back in September. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wondered at first whether or not they had that poster up just sort of to keep everybody energized. Uh, it, it was a curious thing to have in, in a, a Clinton uh, office. Yeah, I think this photo really suggests, you know, okay, well, Hillary's going to help us turn this corner away from, you know, the white the white man who's yelling at us and into a new direction. So the, the arrows are meant to suggest that even the arrow that appears to be painted on the wall is kind of meant to suggest that. I was interested, does anyone know who, what the poster that we can't really see that's right to the left of the gentleman sitting down? Like I'm wondering if she had a bunch of her prospective opponents, you know, on kind of on a, on a, on a wall to target and then suggesting, all right, we're going to move away from them. But I, I can't really tell what's on that other poster. I don't know if there's any other shots um, in this collection that illustrated what the other posters were. Yeah, I would assume it was the campaign workers who put the posters up. Mm -hmm. You know, they're the ones who decided to put them up. Well, you, you mentioned she. And, and you know, I, I was curious about why the people who are, are working uh, on, her, on Clinton's behalf why they would put those posters up. I did a quick Google search this morning because Caria had that same question. I was trying to see, like, are there other images of the space? And I found, a, I, I Googled, I think, Clinton headquarters Brooklyn and found a few other images, but nothing that kind of answered that particular question. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a note, um, uh, I did find a brief note uh, uh, that it was supposedly significant uh, that Hillary's campaign headquarters was going to be in Brooklyn, and that is because Brooklyn is cool, and she was trying to tap into the youthful, modern, contemporary cool of Brooklyn, apparently. Mm -hmm. um, or it could just and, relate to ranch. Yeah, exactly. And so <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the article I saw was sort of saying, oh, she's going to Brooklyn. Well, isn't that interesting? Everybody goes to Brooklyn, right? So um, I don't know, hipsters or otherwise, but um, yeah, it was hard for me to figure out kind of what the space is. Um, uh, the comments, people have been really tapping into some aspects of the images in the comments, so I want to highlight a couple. Um, uh, uh, Ramke says, uh, it looks like Trump is about to swallow that campaign worker. Um, so we can certainly do a lot with the semiotics of this image as well. Um, someone's already pointed out the arrow, for example. Um, Katie Irwin pointed out in her comment that, you know, there's just a, what she calls, there's a lot of hypermediacy in the photo. There's many, many forms of media. You have, you know, things printed out. It appears to be heads printed out. I'm not sure what the heads are. Mm -hmm. um, you've got, obviously, computers, television, sign, you know, kind of all modes of mediation. Somebody um, having a beer. I mean, it's not condensed in these images. Yeah. Yeah. You, you guys have really inspired me in terms of the... Uh, Going, going deep and reading into this picture, but I, <laughs> I keep wanting to. My, my initial, re my initial reaction when I see this image is that I, want to, I want to move over to the right just a little bit to let the perspective kind of open up a little bit. Me and too. then when I look at it, I real, I really want to read. I see, I believe, blah 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 blah, and I really want to read that, and that, in, a, in a way, kind of sums up the politics right now because it's just mm -hmm. it's trying to cut through all the information all the imagery mm -hmm. all the sound bites mm -hmm. to try to really get at like what is everybody saying and so you know in that way this kind of kind of encapsulates that emotion yeah, yeah. yeah. you can't yeah. quite see wow. the actual yeah yeah and, and it's like you know Trump's mouth is open still I mean I I've been <laughs> struck this whole cycle with how many photographs oh. have been published with him with that expression and you know or some variation of it you know and as a photographer that makes me wonder whether or not the the largest proportion of photographs are that or whether people keep selecting that hmm. I suspect he's got hmm. his mouth open a lot he seems to and you know it's it's 
it's forever the image I'm going to have of him during this this whole whole campaign. Yeah. Yeah, we're you sort of a, you saw the picture of Mark Mark Peterson's picture and Mark's incredible, but th that's now on the cover of Washington Post magazine. Oh, yeah. just, and it's just it's just this, you know, and and we did a post on it talking about, you know, Trump as an orifice. You know, that he, Yeah, yeah. It's Anyway, you don't have to say much more. <laughs> no, it Please don't. It doesn't matter what he's actually oh. saying. The actual words don't matter because he lies every five minutes, right? He'll change his tune later. It's just that he's doing it. That's the whole message. So I'm interested in this idea of the, and, and as it plays out in this image, certainly the, what Todd was suggesting about, I can't, like, I want to be able to see clearly, I want to be able to see more, I want a wider view, I want to be able to read more. Um, so, is this, does, is, is this image a kind of, uh, you know, preface to what we're going to see or maybe not see in the fall general? Are we, you know, what do we expect, you know, if we have a, if we have a Clinton-Trump general election, which at least right now is looking quite likely, what do we expect to see? What do we want to see? What do we wish photographers would try to show us more or less of? Um, I mean, I think we have a little bit of time to kind of um, mm -hmm. speculate a bit about the future and maybe try to predict um, what we might be talking about in future salons, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so that's is it going to be this really strict, yeah, tight, narrow view that we're getting in this image? or? How, how do we get around that if we want to? I just think it's chaos right now, personally. Yeah. I mean, the, the conversation out there is basically, where am I going to move if somebody wins this, if a certain person wins this election? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think mm -hmm. That's on both sides, too. Um, and I think mm -hmm. they're drinking a lot of beer, as the journalist is <laughs> in this picture. <laughs> You'll see more <laughs> beer drinking, for sure. So then how do, you, how do you cover this if you're out there? You know, on the campaign, those of you who've done this kind of work, um, do you shift to look for themes that are more presidential? Is there a national kind of lens that a photojournalist might put on that's different from a primary lens? I mean, I'm trying to kind of think about, you know, I know you're very much in the mix of what you're doing every day, but is there yeah. a kind of flip in the way that you or your editors make choices? Well, I think because there are so many candidates right now, well, it's it's starting to, they're starting to weed out, but when there are so many candidates, you know, there's so much emphasis um, put on the horse race aspect of it and covering each candidate and covering, you know, leading up to these elections in the primary. And as as we get closer to having two candidates, things will slow down for sure. Um, and then you'll start be, um, I ideally be, um, focusing more on on the issues, and you know what I would what I would prefer to do, and would prefer to see more of, is people actually really getting out and covering you know covering the issues and covering what what the candidates are are talking about, or at least what they're referring to, and digging into that a little more about about mm -hmm. you know who this country who. Who, who this country is right now, or what this yeah, country is Yeah, I mean, right I now. need to see the faces on these people. I am not, I'm so not interested in the candidates and the canned images at all um, mm -hmm. as a photo editor and a photographer, um, but it's it's out there that I want to see the, you know, dwindling media organizations that we have, last, uh, have left uh, really emphasize their visual coverage. I want to see pictures of people that are voting for Trump, people that are voting for Bernie or, or Hillary, where they live, uh, what they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think, and on the other side of that, though, if it, if it ends up being Clinton and Trump in the general, which is a big if still at this point, but if it does, you know, those are two figures who, if you do the Google image search, probably come up with the most extreme and ridiculous expressions, you know, that we see populated over and over and over in the news, and I worry that um, it, it really is going to become cartoonish in the general if we have two folks who are um, satirized so frequently and whose, whose actual, you know, news photographs are sometimes uh, taken in ways that, that make them laugh, laugh, seem laughable. So I think that there's a real um, possibility that in the general this could just get amped up. Um, these, yeah, I mean, the sort of the two faces of Clinton and Trump. And I, I well, it's a good point. 
that a lot of photographers are already doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, I put up a weekly photograph on on my ethics classes online uh, section, you know, where, where they go for readings and various uh, various other kinds of things. I have a weekly bulletin board. And I have a selection of some very very strange photographs that people have been making from the candidates. You know, the, there's there's one that starts off with with Trump looking like he's just been scared out of his wits, but there's a, a little kid next to him who has Trump color hair going straight up about f four or five inches. You know, their parents for some reason put put it into. Um, well, it's not a mohawk. It just goes straight up, and the two of them look so absolutely silly. And then one, one where Hillary looks like she's preaching to the crowd, and and so I'm asking my students to talk about how that affects their perception of the candidates when those kinds of photographs keep getting published. Mm -hmm. So I think they're already doing that. I, I think editors are are perhaps. I mean, as photographers, we always you see a funny picture, you're going to make it, but editors didn't always publish it. Right. They didn't always put it on online. They don't always put it in print. And I think I think that's where we're headed. Mm -hmm. And Todd, what what do you think? If I you think were... I should also note um, somebody had had this had come up with somebody, but how how photographs are being taken and used now so much and and being used to to demonize a particular candidate, one candidate or, or another and uh, this is, I think, this this election is, is one of the because of uh, Facebook algorithms and social media. It was like the true internet election where one side doesn't see um, is is less likely to see dissenting opinions, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. the way photography mm -hmm. is is taken and, and used, and you know, every day a new meme is created, you know, because because of one goofy picture or another, and mm -hmm. you know, that's just like. You know, creating this really um, crazy visual environment that you know that it wasn't like that. You know, even in 2012 or 2008, and it was a very different, different um, landscape in terms of how photography is being used. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, maybe we, um, maybe there needs to be a salon devoted entirely to images pulled from Instagram, um, made by whomever, <laughs> right? The campaigns. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, "Quote unquote regular people and professional photographers um, in some mix." You know, in other words, social media being a different space, and as you said, all the circulation and appropriation of images, right? So, uh, mm -hmm. the photographer of the woman with the baby at the rally probably didn't expect that image to get photoshopped um, and and to become mm -hmm. uh, its own meme. Um, I just wanted to pull a couple of the comments that people have been making on this broader question of what do you think we'll see, what what do you want to see more or less of, and um, <clears throat> Serge, Serge Levy says, makes an interesting point, says, I'm less concerned with seeing the people than hearing about what's going on with them. Um, you know, I fear that if we focus on the faces too much, um, we won't you know, we'll just perpetuate stereotypes essentially is, is, yeah, is kind point. of the point. And I do, I have to say, I do see this in the context of, you know, the, this what seems to me to be relatively sudden anxiety about, oh my God, who are the who's the Trump voter? Who are these people? And let's talk to them and find out what they think, and then let's talk about how that's inconsistent, as if everyone is consistent about their political opinions, of course. Um, so, so how that plays out visually is an interesting question as well. That um, in in the search for who are you, you know, are you really finding out uh, who people are? Um, uh, versus maybe a coverage of issues in the way that, that um, uh, like Judy, you mentioned earlier, um, what are the issues in the campaign um, as opposed exactly. to the voters? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's what I want to say. Much, oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to say something else, Judy? No, it's it's fine. Well, one of the things that I see, and this is this is inspired by one of the com comments uh, on on the slide, is somebody says. Um, Side note, I noticed some wire services focus on the wacky faces more than others, Reuters being the most common. And and then the later comments, I wonder if that's bias or sales. And Meg mentioned sales. And that brings us all back to how photographs are being moved. It would be before, I mean, I remember Newsweek telling Charles Omni, you know, well, okay, um, uh, George Bush is, is never 
never looking like he's coming unglued when he really is in his campaign. So you know, just watch for those moments. You know, in other words, pictures that actually tell you how things are going. Whereas now, those wacky pictures, word I hate, but wacky pictures are really getting a lot of hits. And see, news is not generated anymore by what people want to know, but the hits, the the uh, the click, the clickbait. You yeah, know? That, that's a really important point because I I think that what's happened in the last four years, three years, is that um, social media has become the curator and, and yes. it really has overshadowed the, the, the impact of the editor. And then the pictures that you now see, it's not because I don't think we're in the worst of times. I think there's actually been a, and more and more, more documentary type photographs, more of the work that Darcy's doing, but, mm -hmm. but you, you don't see it or like we don't generally see it because what happens is that certain this kind of wackier stuff or the gotcha stuff, just on a visual level, forget about words for a second, is what gets uh, attracts um, a, a lot of people really quickly in social media. That gets basically circulated, and then what happens is it gets filtered back into the traditional media. That becomes news because it's just so popular. So so yes. so so it. The, so the filter, the pipeline's getting narrower, even though the breadth of the work, I think, actually is expanding. But it's just, but it's then it's like, what do you get to see, or and you know what, or not? Well, I think I that's going to also happen as the campaigns move forward and the candidates are identified. Yes. You're going to see them closing down the access and having their own photographers cover the candidate, just like. And I love Pete Souza, and he's a great guy, you know. And because I know him so well, I know he's doing a great job at it. But like ultimately, you mm -hmm. know, it's very difficult to cover Obama like Pete Souza gets to because he's his photographer. Um, but I think you're going to definitely see that coming through um, pretty quickly. Well, and and Michael, to the point that you were making as well, um, one thing that I've noticed as I've talked with other colleagues that that we see as a pattern emerging, particularly with Hillary Clinton, but probably some of the other candidates too. The, the photos that are paired with stories in print versions are different than the photos that are paired with stories in their posted online media versions. And often, those photos really don't make sense when you look at the content of the story. The content of the story is either you know, positive coverage or very policy-related coverage. And the photo is this weird, strange, wacky photo. And so, um, and I think that's driven exactly by uh, the factors that you were talking about, Michael. Mm -hmm. I talked with a, a, a photographer who works for a, a large circulation newspaper. He's been a staff photographer there. The staff has been cut tremendously, as many staffs have been cut. And he was, he was complaining, frustrated about his his editors and uh, saying, do you know what your numbers are? Now, when we get to the time when a photographer has to know what their numbers are for their mm -hmm. online presence and how their photographs are being seen, we're going to get this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. We're going to get crazy photographs. And I think what you said, Cara, about there being a different edit in print compared mm -hmm. with online is also reflective of that whole attitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think um, we could keep going, and I want to thank all of you, and I also really want to thank the commenters and the participants. We had a lot of really great activity, and we're really happy uh, that those of you who participated live in the chat uh, and, and logged on live today were here. Um, that's very much what makes the salon lively and interesting, and as you saw, we benefited a lot from your comments. Um, I'm going to hand things off to Michael now uh, to kind of wrap things up and, and uh, maybe tell us what's going to happen next for people that want to access the salon after we're done today. Yes, we'll have um, a replay that'll uh, automatically um, be on uh, our site on the uh, post. I think it just it happens within minutes. And then um, we uh, also, uh, and we've been using Sandra Roa, who's very talented. We've been doing highlight clips. So there will be a, a, a visual synopsis of the the best of uh, conversation from each photo, which will be up in the next um, couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, beyond that, I just want to thank 
uh, our panelists. I really do what it meant what I said at the beginning that there's been so much noise and and so much speed in this election that to be able to just you know stop the roller coaster for a second and really you know have some really thoughtful analysis is not just important but really necessary in this visual culture we live in now. So thank thank you all for for being here and uh, look forward to um, look forward to the next one. Thank you, Michael. It's just Thank a great you. thing you guys have going, and Meg and Phil. It's in fact, it's just really fascinating. I just appreciate it. Thanks so much, everybody. Thanks. Bye bye. See you soon.